Hello and welcome to a whirlwind tour of taxonomy, where I'll try to cover the scope of all living things in 15 minutes. I'm Dr. Mark Williamson, your guide on this journey. So, let's get started with some big questions. What is taxonomy anyways? Well, it comes from Greek word taxis, meaning arrangement, and nomos, meaning the law. So it's the law of arrangement, the science of classifying things. The particular thing I'm interested in today is living things. So I'll be looking at taxonomy as the science of living things. Now, a very important related term when it comes to living things is phylogeny, which studies the evolutionary relationships. And that ties into taxonomy because Organisms are grouped together based on evolutionary histories. Now, another big question is, why should we even care? So why should we care about taxonomy at all, or in fact, science at all? Well, there's two big reasons why. One would be sort of the applied route, what we can get out of it, a, an applied science truth in action. Well, that's perfectly valid. I'll be taking a different tack. I'll be looking at truth as truth. So for its own sake, pure science. I think that studying the organism of Organization of living things is good in its own sake. And that's what I'll be doing today. So, how will I do this? Well, very carefully, through a very high level, be looking at only the biggest types of groups like domains, teams, and phylums. Now, as I'm a macroorganism, and so are you, I will take a little particular attention to larger organisms, gain a little more attention. However, I will cover all groups I can, big and small, specious and rare trying to sort of that, thread the gap between brevity and completeness. And as any sort of science, it's not completely settled. Some taxonomic groups are still up in the air. And as we learn more about taxonomy, these things will be resolved or even shuffled around. So with that being said, let's talk about the biggest picture. I'll start at the very top, the two main types of life, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. I'll go into more details in those. Those being the without and with a nucleus. Also include viruses. Now, many definitions of life, life don't consider viruses to be alive, but I'm going to include them for completeness because they're certainly related to life, made of the same genetic material that you and I and everything else is. So, drilling down a little bit, these are the major groups within those biggest groups I'll be talking about. I'll be talking about, first, again, the macroorganisms on the eukaryote side, talk about animals, fungi, plants, and their close relatives, and then what I'm more or less calling protist, it's uh, protist is sort of a grab bag term of eukaryotes that didn't fill anywhere else, and it turns out they're actually really like kingdom level diverse, so we'll cover that all in like one fell swoop. Then on the prokaryote side, we'll talk about bacteria, archaea, and then finish up with viruses, not shown here. So let's get started with animals. So animals are within this larger group, Enomorpha, but then specifically Apistoconta. They're Apistocontids. Animals, there's about 32 different phyla, give or take a couple, depending on how you group them. This is a good representation here. So just to get a, a bit of a concept of the sizes, so I've taken all the animal phyla, and the circles represent the number of species. So you can see here, arthropods are well and away the most specious group more than all the others combined. And then there's about seven or eight other phyla that are considered major phyla, and a bunch of minor phyla that you probably never heard of unless you're a taxonomist. So let's go into these 32 phyla. We'll start with arthropods, the biggest. They're jointed foot, so insects, crustaceans, etc. There's mollusks, they're soft-bodied. They can have a shell or not, so think of clams, octopus, snails. Chordates, those are things with notochords, includes vertebrates, so you, me, your dog, your goldfish, etc. Then on the second row here, we have worms. Worms are very important. They're a plurality of animal phyla. So we have, whoops, we have platyhemids, nematodes, and annelids. These are the flat worms, round worms, and segmented worms. The bottom three major phyla here, Cnidaria, those are the jellyfishing kin, Porifera sponges, and Echinodermata, sea stars, sea urchins, etc. These are pretty much exclusively marine. Okay. To look at the other minor phyla, I've sort of conceptually grouped some of them just to kind of get our handle on it. So I have the other worm section because a lot of things are called worms. There's Nemerta and Nematomorpha. These are the horsehair, or sorry, the ribbon and horsehair worms. Anchicophora, these are the velvet worms. Chetognathia and Gathnosumulidia, these are the arrow worms and jaw worms. And then Predipolidia. 
for lack of a better word, these are the phallus worms. Then there's the brushes, which is these are actually phylogenetically sort of closely related. These have a, a brush-like ring of tentacles. So bryozoa are moss animals, lursifer are brush heads, foraminida are the horseshoe worms, and entoprocta are the goblet worms. Then I have this group I'm conceptually saying the mistaken identity, ones that could be easily confused with larger, more charismatic phyla. There's brachiopodas, which are the lamp shells. You could mistake them with mollusks. Satanophora, these are the comb jelly, not true jellyfish like the other phyla, but their own phylum. And then hemichordata, half chord. These are not chordates, these are in fact acorn worms. I'm calling these hidden gems. These are weird and wonderful invertebrates, phyla that are just so cool that you really should know about. So rotifers are the wheel bearers, tardigrades, which you probably have actually heard of. These are the water bears, they're very charismatic. Gastrolecas, the hairy bellies, and then my personal favorite, the kinorenkas, the mud dragons. And then finally, the small, smallest, rarest, least well-known, they don't even have common names to describe them, nomenclature pending, so I've created nomenclature for you. So there's the xenoclomorpha, the xenoworms, rhombozoa, lozenge worms, orthonectida, the amoeba worms, placozoa, excuse me, Placozoa are the blob animals, cyclophora are the lobster lobes, and micronathozoa with one species are the gnash worms. Moving along to another major group, we have fungi. These are also actually apistocontists, so closely related to animals. And they have, are notable for having chitin in their cell walls. Now there are two major phylas that make up the bulk of all species, then a bunch of minor phylas, which we'll get into. These being phylogenetic groupings. There's uh, the caria, which have ascomycota and basidiomycota. These are really any mushroom, fungi, puffball, whatever. When it, if you think of the word fungus, it's probably one of these. Then there's another minor phyla in there. There's the chytridiomycota, which a bunch of various forms. Epistosporidia, with notably the phylum cryptomycota which are hidden fungi. These notably lack chitin. They secondarily lost it. A couple other monophyla, including mucoromycota, which includes molds, including like bread mold. Okay, we've gone on to that. Let's talk about plants and their relatives, other photosynthesizers. Now these are found in another major clade. So plants can also be called chloroplastidia. They're following this larger archaeoplastidia with their close relatives. Now there's all sorts of diversity in plants, especially seeded plants, that we have to just skip over and go right to the highest levels. Divisions. So in the plant world, division is analogous to phylum. So there are seven plant divisions. There's anthroceratophyta, bryophyta, hepatocophyta, and lycophyta, the hornworts, mosses, liverworts, and club mosses. And then pteridopsida, Sphenopsida, these are the ferns and horsetails, and then Spermatophyta, these are the seed plants, so every tree, every flower, every fruit, every vegetable are going to be found in these seed plants. And then there's five phyla of algae, algae being sort of the shorthand term for anything that photosynthesizes. So the Streptophyta and Chlorophyta, these are green algae. Glycophyta is a single-celled algae, and then Rhodontophyta and Rhodelphus, these are red algae and the sister group. All right, we're on to protist, or as I like to say, eukaryotes abroad. Because again, this, despite being somewhat of a grab bag, it turns out they have very high level, like supergroup, kingdom level diversity, which we'll get into. Now, we've already seen Archaeoplastidia as one of the eukaryotes and Epistoconda, so we'll cover everything else. Now, one note of Pisoconta that I just have to briefly mention includes fungi and animals, or metazoa, and then some very closely related groups that we really can just show here and then move on because that's all the time we have. Because we really need to talk about protists or other eukaryotes. There's all sorts of clades that I've sort of grouped together. These are phylogenetic. So there's SAR clade. This is acronym for the four phyla in there. These are diatoms, diaphylangioids, important parasites, even kelp. The hapista, these are a very interesting sort of groups of, of ciliates, or not so much ciliates, but um, there are going to be algal forms, 
as well as uh, kind of sort of these almost spiky, but spiky ciliates. Anyways, getting a little too much into the details because we have to get to Crepista, where these are very enigmatic heterotrophic flagellates. There's amorphia, which has a pistaconta, which we already talked about, as well as amoeboids and other related ones. Another acronym here, CRUMS, which unfortunately now some of the names have changed and the first letter of the phylum doesn't really match up anymore, but these have all sorts of morphological features. It's a very big grab bag. There's also excavata, which probably isn't uh, phylogenetically consistent, so that's why it's kind of separated out. It's still in question. There's a, a minor one, hematostilgophora, which are very interesting because they have double role of ciliates. And then there's a bunch of orphan phyla that maybe are a little bit, some might be with excavator, some might be on their own, it's sort of unknown. So still a lot of this high level taxonomy phylogeny to do. All right, wow. If you thought protists were diverse, you ain't seen nothing yet because we're on to bacteria. Bacteria, one of the two domains of prokaryotes, they're single cell, no, no nucleus. Bacteria are incredibly diverse. Now for a while, we knew they were quite diverse, but we could only understand them by isolating them and culturing them. But now with metagenomics, that is sequencing them directly from the environment, there's been a huge explosion of new species that we've discovered, queued up initially as the candidate phyla radiation. Now to keep all these phyla intact, or sort of conceptually together, I'm using the most comprehensive database I could find, the Genome Taxonomy Database. I'll be referring to that. And then just to add another ball of wax to confusion, a lot of the main phyla have actually been renamed recently, so we have to keep that in mind too. So let's get on to major groups, and a lot of this is sort of conceptually grouping. So first I have what I call the big four. These are far and away the most specious, the biggest groups. There's Pseudomonadota, which used to be called Proteobacteria. There's Bacilliota, which actually has nine phyla now. They used to be called Firmicutes. Used to be not one phylum split out to nine with suffixes, so A, B, C, D, etc. Actinomyciota, which used to be actinobacteria, and bacteria dota, which used to be called bacteria dates. Next, I'm conceptually calling what's called fractured phyla, just like Bacilliota, these ones, the Sophobacteriota, etc., used to be one phylum, but then they've been split out into multiple phylum with suffixes. Then uh, the one sort of Phylogenetically consistent grouping I have here is a PDC superphylum that clusters pretty well together, including Plankton, Mycidiota, etc. And then there's some other major ones that can really conceptually group that I just sort of put around the edge here. A couple things to note cyanobacteria are very important because they're blue green algae. And then Patsia bacteria, remember how I mentioned the candidate phyla radiation? A lot of those newly discovered species groups are ultimately sort of described as this phylum in. The database. All right, so that was just a little bit. We've got a lot more to go because we have to talk about minor groups. I call them minor by how, because they have between 600 and three genomes, but they are still named. So they still have a Latin name here. So the ones on the left here, they have between 600 and 100 genomes, not species, but genomes. So that can be some overlap. Oops, excuse me. And then these are the extra minor they have between 100 and 3. So very minor. We can't even do anything but just show them. But they're there. But it gets even worse because there's what I call dark matter. Dark matter is thrown around in uh, bacteria studies. But how I'm defining it is ones phyla that don't even have Latin names. They just have numbers and letters. And I can't really honestly tell you the difference between like these two or these two without really having to dig into everything. Uh, the one thing of note that I can separate out is SAR-324 I put on its own. This is a very well-known clade. Now, we scientists discover in the ocean through metagenomic sequences, it turns out it's crazily diverse. We just couldn't isolate it. So there's a lot in the dark matter. And so with those three groupings, there is 181 bacteriophyla. So moving on to our kale, a little more constrained. There are also prokaryotes actually more closely related to eukaryotes than bacteria, but they've had a similar radiation with metagenomic sequencing. And so let's talk a little bit about archaea. So there's a, and these are all uh, phylogenetically grouping, not conceptual. So Uriarchaeota, the most well-known, these are the more recently, or sorry, more ancestrally sequenced and cultured. A lot of these could actually be cultured. 
So Halobacteriota. A lot of these are, are actually extremophiles. They were first discovered in extreme environments. It's crazy to think that archaea wasn't discovered until like the 1960s, a whole other domain of life that we didn't know about. But we're learning more about them with these 21 phyla. So I talked about your archaeota. There's TAC. This used to be the super phylum. Used to be that acronym, but they all kind of got broken down into thermal proteota now with modern phylogeny. Then there's the DPAN superphylum. Again, acronyms. The only two extent ones are these two for the ends. And then the DP and A are now subphyla within nanoarchaeota. And then a bunch of other ones, as they were discovered, were tacked onto the superphylum. There's unnamed, so more dark matter. And then a very important one, Asgardi archaeota, very recently described. It turns out, rather than eukaryotes being a sister group to archaea, it's most likely that eukaryotes actually arose out of archaea itself, namely Asgardi archaeota. So very interesting stuff there. All right. With that, let's get to viruses. So whether viruses are living or not, uh, you can still taxonomically classify them. So that's what I'm going to do. There's a lot of ways you can do that. You can do it by how their genetic code is, whether they're DNA, RNA, double-stranded, single-stranded, whether they're enveloped or not. But you can do more classical sort of taxonomy. So based on uh, a viral database, there are six realms of viruses. So virus realms are analogous to domains in other living things or in living things. So there are six domains, Ad adnaviria, duplidnaviria, monadnaviria, riboviria, ribozyviria, and rinaviria, with 17 different phyla distributed across them, including things that are not phyla, that are just a grab bag up here that aren't in any realm. And then interesting, a single family not in a phyla within this realm. All right, we went through a lot. Let's do a quick review to keep ourselves going. So we started with eukaryotes. We talked about animals, 32 phyla. Fungi, 12 phyla. Plants, seven divisions, and then five algal divisions. Protist, seven to eight supergroups, which also included the animal groups that include animals, fungi, and plants. Over on prokaryotes, we had 181 bacterial phyla, a lot of it poorly described. Archaea, 21 phyla. And finally, viruses with six realms and 17 phyla. Whew. Thanks for coming along on this whirlwind tour, a tumbling tome of just how many living things are out there. I look forward to diving more into these groups to see just what sort of surprises are around every corner when it comes to the tree of life. Thanks for your time.